Oh, thank you, Gene.
Good morning, welcome to our service here this morning. It's good to gather together on the Lord's Day. A welcome to you if you're not able to be with us but are joining us on the live stream. Later we'll be thinking about uh, uh, David's concern for the house of God and for uh, God's uh, worship. Uh, a psalm that picks up on that, an earlier psalm, is Psalm 87, which reads, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Let's come together in prayer. O Lord our God, we come this morning to worship you. And we thank you that we do not need to travel to Jerusalem for that purpose in these days. We thank you for the blessing of a New Testament worship. We thank you that wherever your people meet, there is a house for God. And we pray then that as we have gathered together into this place today, we may be very conscious of your presence with us. We have the promise of your word through your servant James. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so we would draw near this morning in the precious name of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would receive us and accept our worship as we come to you in his name. Hear us then, we ask in these things, uh, for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you're using a hymn book, our first hymn is number 366. And you'll see it picks up on that expression in Psalm 87. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode. Let's stand to sing. <laughs> Ecclesiastes this morning and we're on chapter 11 and I'm going to read the whole chapter starting at verse 1. Um, so that's Ecclesiastes and chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. 
Give a serving to seven, and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Uh, thank you, Nate. <clears throat> now it's time for the children's talk. I have a visual aid here. Hold on a second. Right. Children, can you see what I've got in my hand? Can you see what I've got in my hand? Samuel? Sorry? You can't see it. But <laughs> I, I expected that to be the, the, the honest answer. Can you guess what, perhaps what I've got in my hand? No, you can't. Eat. Joseph, what do you think I've got in my hand? No? Yes, James? String? No, it's not string. It's much thinner than string. Tell you what, let's have a pic. All of us have got a lot of this. We'll put a picture up on... I guess you've guessed it by now. Let's have the picture up. Shall we, can we have the picture? Well, it's an excuse to show you my latest little granddaughter, really. <laughs> But everybody in that picture, three generations, and all of, all of those people, both the grandma, the mother, and the two children, have got lots of on their head. What is it, Samuel? Hair. hair. That's right, they've got lots of hairs on their head. In fact, do you know how many hairs you've got on your head? Roughly. I guess you haven't counted every one of them. Could you guess how many hairs you might have on your head? What scientists tell us? Well, some people haven't got any, I know. So. <laughs> but they reckon the average person's got 100,000 hairs on their head. About 100,000 hairs. That's incredible, isn't it? And we couldn't possibly count them all. We'd soon lose track, and we lose a few each day anyway, and other ones grow. Well, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you because it fits in nicely with the next questions on our children's catechism. Let's have... Let's have those questions up, please. The first one we looked at last time, can you see God? Do you remember the answer to that question? Can you see God? Samuel? No, but how does the answer continue? No, but... Do you remember how it continues? We can't see God, no, but... Do you reckon James? Well done, he can see us. That's right. I cannot see God, but he always sees me. Let's say that together, shall we? Can you see God? No, I cannot see God, but he always sees me. Now let's have the next question. <clears throat> Does God know all things? Now when I asked you earlier <clears throat> what I got in my hand, you didn't even know what, what I'd got. But that's because you couldn't see it. Then you didn't know how many hairs you'd got, did you? How many hairs you've got on your head? I don't know exactly either. None of us do. But we reckon it's about 100,000. <clears> but do you know what Jesus said about the hairs on your head? Jesus said the hairs of your head are all numbered. In other words, God knows every single hair that you've got on your head. Isn't that incredible? God knows how many hairs you've got down to the very last one. Exactly how many hairs we've each got. God knows. Does God know all things? Let's have the answer. Yes, 
nothing can be hidden from God. So again, I'll ask the question and we'll say the answer together. Does God know all things? Yes, nothing can be hidden from God. And you see, the important thing to remember, children, is that not only does God know all of the hairs that are on the outside of our heads, but God also knows all of the thoughts that are on the inside of our heads, that go on in our mind. That one of the Psalms tells us about how God knows every thought in our, in our hearts, in our minds. We can't hide them from God. God knows all about us. And that's why we need to come to God and confess our sins to him, because he sees all of those as well anyway. And we need God to take care of us and watch over us, because God does know all about us. So let's say that answer one more time together. Does God know all things? Yes, Nothing can be hidden from God. Well, thank you, children, for listening to me. <clears throat> Let's have our, our second hymn. Uh, if you're using a hymn book, it's number 502. Oh, what riches and what virtue far beyond the thought of man <clears throat> are invested in our Saviour in the wonder of of God's plan. Let's stand to sing.
Now, before we come to the notices, it's a special pleasure today formally to welcome into membership uh, Steve and Jess Playl. So I'm going to ask Steve and Jess to come uh, to the front. And I'm going to read out our church covenant, uh, which they will then indicate their assent to. It's very long since you've been before. I know. <laughs> This is, of course, a good reminder to all who are church members of the uh, <coughs> pledges that we've made to one another. We as a company of men and women who have personally experienced the saving power of Jesus Christ and have been made children of God by the new birth, do solemnly covenant before God and with one another to give our loyalty and devotion to him in Banbury Evangelical Free Church as one body in Christ. We further pledge ourselves by the enabling of the Holy Spirit to do the following. And there are a number of Bible references, which I won't uh, cite, I'll just read the, the bare text. Uh, to work and pray for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and to pray for ourselves and others. To walk together in brotherly love, as becomes the members of a Christian church, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, and faithfully admonishing and entreating one another as occasion may require. Three, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor to neglect the observance of the Lord's Supper. Four, to endeavour to bring up such as may at any time be under our care in the training and admonition of the Lord, and by a pure and loving example to seek the salvation of our family and friends. Five, to rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavour with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. Six, to seek with God's help to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, and remembering that as we have been buried by baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave, so there is on us a special obligation now to lead a new and holy life. Seven, to work together for the continuance of a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline and doctrines. Eight, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. Nine, and when we move from this place, as soon as possible to unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Are you both able to assent to those things? It sounds a lot, doesn't it, when you read it all out? But actually all, all these things I say they are supported by scripture verses and it's really just how we should be living together as a, a family of God's, of God's people. So, are you happy with that? Yes. yes. Uh, let, me, uh, no, let me ask you to sign. Um, it's a bit, bit formal, I know, but if you wouldn't mind each signing the... Do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Um, go. Ladies first. <laughs> Excellent. Let me just pray for you as, as we come in. Heavenly Father, we do again thank you for your goodness to us as a church in bringing Steve and Jess and their girls to us. Uh, we thank you for inclining their hearts to commit themselves to the life and work of this church. And we pray then for your rich blessing upon them as they formally into, enter into membership with us at this time. We commit them into your hands and we pray that you make them very useful servants of yours in the, the life of our fellowship together. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also just say thank you everyone to the warm welcome that we've received since we've started coming here. Um, it's really appreciated and yeah, um, we pray that we will um, yeah, share fellowship much as we have done since we've started. Uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few notices then before we come to uh, prayer. Um, there are refreshments afterwards. Do stay for those if you can. Uh, this evening we have our communion service at 5.45. It's a separate service before the main worship service, open to born-again believers who are living a consistent Christian life. 
If you're not a church member but would like to participate, if you haven't already done so, please speak to one of the elders, either myself or David Umpleby, uh, before you do so. Uh, then going through the week, uh, we, have our, well, we then have our main service at 6.30 this evening, which of course all are warmly welcomed. Going through the week, the elders meet tomorrow morning. We have our next Bible study on Wednesday evening at 7.30 at Briar Close. I uh, encourage you to come along in person if you can, but the Zoom link is also available if you can't make it. On uh, Saturday, uh, we have the market stall throughout the day. Uh, so we do need volunteers for that. Perhaps, Jenny, you could uh, round up volunteers today um, for next Saturday. And uh, then also in the open air, God willing, uh, in the afternoon, rather, we have the open air preaching uh, as well in town from about 2.30. Uh, so again, we encourage support for that. If you're able to come along just for a part of that time, it would be much appreciated just to stand there. A crowd helps to draw a crowd. If you want to give out leaflets, you could do that, but there's no obligation on you to do anything, really, apart from being there and being an encouragement. We're there from about 2.30. We have a prior prayer time at my home at 1.45 or thereabouts, and then we're downtown from 2.30 till around 4 or so, depending on how things develop. Our Saturday night prayer meeting, as usual, will be at 9 o'clock on Zoom. And then next Lord's Day, we have visiting preacher Andrew Lolly. Uh, some of you may remember him when you see him. He preached for us a good number of years ago when he was a, a student at London Seminary. Uh, since then, he's had a pastorate in Perth, in Scotland. But he and his wife are now uh, currently living in Yorkshire. So they'll be with us for the weekend next Lord's Day. Uh, one other thing just to mention, and that's the, uh, the fact that on the 5th of June, uh, Sunday 5th of June in the morning, uh, that we're going to mark the Queen's Platinum uh, Jubilee uh, on that morning by having a, a service that will focus on Thanksgiving for Her Majesty the Queen and, and her reign and so on. And we will also be having a fellowship lunch after that, a bring a share, buffet lunch. So uh, do... Come to that if you can. Think of those you might like to invite to that service and to the lunch afterwards as well. So that's on the 5th of June, God willing. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we do give thanks for the gospel of your saving grace that draws men and women and young people to yourself and unites them together in church fellowship to live together, to glorify you and to serve you all the days of our pilgrimage here on this earth. And we pray then that as a church you would continue to go before us, that you would use us for the glory of your name, for the extension of your kingdom and for the, the gathering in of precious souls into that kingdom. We have just spoken of the uh, work of this uh, week and particularly the outreach of Saturday and we want to commit that work to you. We pray over the market stall. We thank you for the way you have enabled us to have that stall now over uh, a good num number of years, many years, uh, with uh, little uh, intermission apart from the hiatus caused by the uh, pandemic. And we thank you for the way that that stall has been used over the years to uh, be an, an encouragement to some to come along to uh, this uh, church. Uh, we thank you for the many, many conversations that have taken place at the bookstall over the years. And uh, we pray then that this coming Saturday may be another such occasion. We pray for suitable weather. We pray for those uh, to pass by who will be inclined to browse the literature and stop and chat. And we do pray then that you would use that very simple, low-key form of outreach to the town. We pray too over the open air preaching in the afternoon uh, and we pray that you would grant to us much uh, grace and wisdom as we seek to proclaim uh, the gospel of your saving grace uh, in a more overt way uh, to those who pass by there. Uh, we pray for each one who takes part whether in preaching or in supporting the work in one way or another and we do ask O oh Lord that you would use the preaching of your word to draw souls to yourself. We are mindful that we are living in a society that is increasingly godless, uh, increasingly secular, uh, a society that increasingly is 
open about its uh, atheism. But how we pray, O Lord, that you who have written your law upon the hearts of sinners so that they have a, a conscience of what is right and what is wrong, how we pray then that you would awaken such people uh, to the truths that in the depths of their hearts they know. For we know that you have placed eternity in the hearts of men. And we pray then that you would awaken people to see that their atheism is a front and indeed that it is an affront to you. And we pray that you would have mercy upon uh, precious souls as they come under the sound of the gospel of your saving grace. We pray that as a church and as individuals uh, we may commend the Saviour uh, to those around us. We know that the evil one loves to stir up uh, hatred and loves to paint a caricature of what the uh, Christian gospel is but how we pray that we may disarm such objections by our own manner of life that whereas uh, they may speak against us as evildoers they may by our good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation so we pray for the advance of the gospel here in this town and indeed in this country uh, we pray for every faithful church that is meeting today and ask that you would bless the proclamation of uh, your gospel in every congregation. And we pray too for the wider needs across the world. We again think of the tragedy of the war that is still raging in Ukraine and we pray your mercy in that situation. Uh, we pray that the aggressor may be foiled. Uh, we pray that peace may be restored we pray that you would comfort those who are in great uh, trauma and loss at this time and we pray O oh Lord that in your inscrutable wisdom you would use even these terrible events for the furtherance of the gospel in that land so we do commend to you your people in Ukraine we think of the uh, EMF missionaries that we have heard of in recent weeks and we know there are many others of your people in that land as well. We pray for every faithful uh, evangelical congregation and ask that you would use their witness and their testimony at this time. And as they have been caught up in the, in the loss and the tragedy of, of their fellow men, uh, we pray that you grant them much grace that uh, people may take note of the remarkable way you uphold your people in times of trial and uh, difficulty. We pray then for the spread of the gospel across the world. We ask that the earth may be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And we thank you that even among our congregation here we have people from different countries across the globe and it's a reminder to us that your work is indeed worldwide. And we pray then for every, every nation that is represented among us here that uh, you would be at work that even in those lands where there is at the present time much hostility to the gospel, you would continue to work by your spirit, because we know that when you work, no one can hinder it and turn it back. And Lord, we want to, put, to commit one another to you in our individual circumstances. You know the, uh, the situations that we are each in in our lives. We continue to pray for those among us who are sick who are, or who are still recovering. We pray that you would restore them fully to health uh, before uh, very long. We pray for those with uh, challenges ahead of them. We think of the uh, school students with exams this week and uh, we pray for them that you would help them and uh, help them to cast their burdens upon you, uh, we pray. So Lord, we commit all of these things into your hands now. Hear our prayers and forgive our sins because we come to you in the precious name of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we ask everything in that precious name. Amen. All right, it's time for the children to leave us for junior church and for crash. And we're going to sing our next hymn. Uh, which is number 740. Seek this first, not earthly pleasure, fading joy and failing treasure, but the love that knows no measure. Seek this 
for 7.40. We're continuing this morning to uh, look at the songs of ascents in the Psalms, and we've reached Psalm 132, which is by quite a long way uh, the longest of these uh, Psalms, so I'm going to break it into two, and this morning we'll uh, look at the first ten verses, and then God willing, uh, next time, in a fortnight's time, we'll be looking at the latter part of the Psalm. I'm going to read just the first 10 verses uh, this morning. Psalm 132, uh, a song of ascents. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not sleep, give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. And let your saints shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Now if, as many suppose, these uh, psalms, these songs of ascents were sung by the pilgrims as they made their way up to uh, Jerusalem, and if we suppose that they were sung in sequence as uh, the pilgrims went on their journey, then this psalm uh, is one that would surely have been sung uh, as they arrive at or at least approach Jerusalem itself uh, for the worship of God there in the temple that by this time has now been set up. And as they sing this psalm, then they are reflecting on David's concern for the centre of God's worship to be established in the kingdom. And now, years later, as the psalm is sung, the worshippers can express their joy that there is a house for God, that there they may enjoy the presence of God. Indeed, that there they may experience the favour of God. 
And the question then for us as we look at this psalm this morning is, do we have the same spirit as those Old Testament worshippers? We need to. And let's uh, think about that question and interrogate this psalm by asking uh, three questions. Firstly, are you seeking the house of God? That was David's ambition as described in these early verses. Remember David and all his afflictions. He had many afflictions as a a younger man before he became king, but he still had many burdens which could be called afflictions when he had become king, didn't he? He had many responsibilities. It was his task as the king over Israel to to strengthen the uh, territorial integrity of the country. It was still under threat from its enemies around. The Philistines, not least, of course, were constantly seeking to invade at different points. And David had the task of uh, of seeking to uh, give give some stability to the nation. And, And not only from external attack, he had the task as well of unifying the nation under his rule. You'll remember the previous king, King Saul, when King Saul died, most of the nation expected one of Saul's surviving sons, Ishbosheth, to be king. And indeed he became king. We often overlook that. He was made king by the, most of the tribes of Israel and reigned for two years. Before eventually the uh, recognition was, was given to David that he was the rightful king. And then the whole country accepted his rule. But he had to unite then all these disparate tribes, some of whom hadn't been in favour of him to begin with. And of course, much of the historical narrative focuses on these, these things, these tasks that David had in establishing the kingdom under his uh, rule. But the Psalms reveal to us the deepest burden of David's heart. And that was as it's expressed here in verse 5, that was to find a place for the Lord. During uh, the the wilderness years, God has spoken of how they would be settled in the land and there would be a place where God would place his name there. And that place has still not yet been established when David is first king. And so here we have the deepest burden of his heart expressed in verses Uh, 3 to 5 in the form of a vow made to the Lord now there's no record in the historical books of David making a a vow exactly like that recorded here and indeed some have argued it would be it would would have been wrong for David to make a vow exactly like this it would have been inappropriate to seem to be twisting God's arm by saying I'm not even going to go to bed until I've sorted out this issue of where God is going to place his name. But I'm not sure that we need to worry too much about whether David made a vow of exactly this nature. It could well be a a poetic sort of overstatement to underscore David's ardent desire. This was something that was constantly on his mind when he got up in the morning and when he went to bed at night that there should be a place for God. You see, during the wilderness years, and during the days of the judges, it would seem afterwards, the the tabernacle had moved around. At the end of the days of the judges, we know it was in Shiloh. told that in 1st book of Samuel, chapter 1. A little later, in chapter 21 of that same book, the tabernacle was found at a place called Nob and David visited it there on one occasion. But neither of those places were the place where God had said he would put his name. And what is more, it seems that the ark of God had been largely sidelined. For 20 years it had been at a place called Kirjath Jearim after it had been wrongly misused as a sort of mascot when the Israelites had gone into battle under King Saul. 
So David is concerned to find a dwelling place for God. And we're told in 2 Samuel chapter 6 how he arranged to bring the ark of God back to Jerusalem and then in the following chapter how he planned to build a temple for the Lord. That was David's ambition. Now it's unlikely that David was actually the writer of this psalm, Psalm 132. As some have suggest, suggested, it was more likely to have been Solomon who actually wrote it. David is unlikely to have referred to himself in the third person in uh, verse 1. He doesn't do that in his other psalms. He speaks in the first person. And of course we know that it was during the reign of Solomon that the temple then was uh, built. And Solomon himself summarises quite well how it happened at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. Let me just read to you a few verses here. Where Solomon says, it was, in, uh, it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke. And I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of David, sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I have made a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So David's ambition is brought to uh, uh, fruition now in the uh, dedication of the temple by Solomon. But Solomon recognises something important about the temple. He was well aware of the limitations of that temple. And so later in his uh, prayer of dedication, he says to the Lord, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven... And the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. This temple is, is a magnificent temple. It's, a, it's a, a picture of God's presence among his people. But God can't really dwell in a temple made with hands. And Solomon recognised that. And we don't meet in a temple, do we? We meet in a school canteen. Does that mean that God can't be here? No, of course it doesn't mean that. And that leads on really to the second question I would put to you. Do you seek the presence of God? That's what really matters. And the presence of God was symbolised by the ark, which is mentioned in verse 8, and which I've also mentioned already two or three times. Now, what was the ark when we're children, the first thing we think about when we hear the word ark is Noah and the animals on the ark. It was a big boat that uh, Noah got into to be kept safe during that worldwide catastrophic flood. But the ark uh, was also a little box uh, that was uh, made under the direction uh, of God by Moses, or by Moses' craftsmen, I should say, and it was really the, the central focus of the worship of God under uh, the old order of things. It was placed in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Just a little wooden box. But on it was the gold mercy seat. And the high priest would go into the most holy place on that day of atonement, the holiest day in their calendar, and would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And uh, that symbolised the uh, reconciliation of the people uh, to God. As I say, it was just a little wooden box. And in that box, uh, in the days of Moses at least, there were, there were three things. There was the Ten Commandments, there was a pot of manna and there was Aaron's rod that budded. 
And above the box, above that most holy place, during the wilderness years, there had been that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that really denoted the presence of God with God's people. Well, once they'd entered the promised land, they hadn't needed the pillar of fire to guide them, and that had disappeared. And the ark itself had been misused. As I mentioned, it was used as a sort of mascot on one occasion and was then captured by the Philistines for a period. And it had become neglected. It had been shelved uh, in uh, uh, somebody's house in Kirjath Jirim. And its significance, it would seem, had been overlooked by many. It was like some piece of treasure that had uh, got buried and then eventually it gets forgotten, doesn't it? But somebody's does the research, they, they hear about this treasure, they, they explore all the avenues and they find out where it is. And of course that's what David had done. He had found the ark. We read in verse 6 here, Behold, we heard of it in Ephratah, we found it in the fields of the woods. <clears throat> Commentators are undecided as to what is being meant by Ephratah here. Is it a town in, in Ephraim? There was apparently such a place, but the ark was never recorded as being at such a place. More likely, it seems to me, this is a reference to Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephratah, which, of course, was David's birthplace. And while the ark itself was never there, David, of course, was there. Uh, and he could simply be saying, this is where David first heard of the ark of God through the teaching of his godly father, Jesse. And he then uh, took the steps to establish, where is the ark gone? Ah, it's a kirjath Jiri. Out in that rural location. And now he wants the ark to be brought back. So that he can worship at God's footstool, because the ark is just a picture, as it were, of God's footstool. God is in heaven but the ark on earth is, as it were, where God is seated. Because that's where he's going to encounter God. And that's his desire. The ark symbolised the presence of God. But also, as I hope you will have already picked up, it also symbolised how we may come into God's presence via the blood-sprinkled mercy seat. In other words, the ark was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Again, think of those three things that had been in the ark. It contained the law of God. The unbroken tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments. Christ has kept that law perfectly. Previously, it had also contained, as I mentioned, the pot of manna. Now, by the time of Solomon, it had been lost, probably sometime during its period with the Philistines, I guess. But the pot of manna in the ark was a reminder to the Israelites of how God had fed them in the wilderness. It was a picture of God's provision for his people. And Christ is the source of our spiritual food. And the ark had previously also contained Aaron's rod, which is a picture of rule, of government, and Christ rules over his people. And just as blood then was sprinkled on top of the mercy seat for Old Testament worshippers to be accepted, so we must depend upon that shed blood of the Lord Jesus at Calvary for our acceptance. David wants God's priests then to be clothed with righteousness. He wants God's people to shout with joy. Having searched out the ark and found it and placed it at the centre of worship. And David then sets before us, and this, this psalm written later sets before us, a model for seeking God. Just as David and Ephrata heard of the ark of God and sought it out. So you have heard of the way of salvation. 
I've mentioned it already again this morning. The way is not the ark. You don't need to try and find the lost ark of Israel today. The way is Jesus. And you need to seek God's face through him. Those who seek shall find. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. In New Testament worship, we're all priests, friends. It's not the man at the front who's the priest. We are all kings and priests unto God, if we are Christian believers. Clothed in righteousness, a righteousness given by God, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed to us, put to our account by faith. And when we experience that, we should surely shout for joy. God has so blessed his people. Well, as the Old Testament worshippers gathered, they were thankful then for the fact that God had, through David, established the worship of God in Jerusalem. And through Solomon had built the temple where they could still gather and have the uh, recognition that this was where God had said he would meet with them as they came via the way that he had ordained, as it were, before the ark of God. And yet they still wanted to be sure of God's favour resting upon them. And I ask you then this morning, do you seek God's favour on your life? Look at verse 10. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. David is always looked back to as the founding king of Israel. Solomon was a, Saul, I beg your pardon, was really a sort of false start. David was the first great recognised king appointed by God to rule over his people. And David then as the king is the representative of the people of God. Just as the, the priest represented the people in his way, so does the king represent all of the people of God. So the prayer here is, for your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Let the anointed king be accepted by God. So that we are accepted. To turn away the face is to refuse someone's petition. The expression is also used, for example, in the first book of Kings, when uh, Solomon had uh, become king and his mother uh, went to him with a, a misguided request, as it turned out. And uh, she went to Solomon the king rose up to meet her, bowed down to her, sat down on his throne, had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat at his right hand, then she said, I desire one small petition of you. Do not refuse me. And the marginal note tells us that that is literally saying, do not turn away the face. Do not turn your face from me. I have a small petition. Do not turn away your face. Do not refuse me. And this prayer then is saying, on the basis of the covenant that God has made with David, and we'll think a bit more about that covenant uh, next time when we look at the mention of it in the second half of the psalm. On the basis of the covenant made with David, do not, do not cease to show favour to your people. May our king, representative of all of us, be accepted. And down through the years, we know many of David's successors were ungodly men. But still this plea held good for your servant David's sake. Because of the covenant made with David. Please continue to show the face of your favour to your people. Do not turn away the face of your anointed. 
Now you may well already know, and if you've got a marginal, a reference Bible, you'll see it in the margin there, that the word translated anointed here is literally the Hebrew word Messiah. Do not turn away the face of your Messiah. Again, this points us to how we may find favour with God, not by anything that we have done, but by pleading God's anointed Messiah, King Jesus. This is our only plea with God. Do you still feel distant from God? Would you say you've sought God, but you can't say you've found him? Do you fear with uncertainty as to whether God will accept you? Well, let's be very clear. God will not accept you as you are by nature. As the man born blind who was healed in John chapter 9 says, God does not hear sinners. And we are all sinners. Our own righteousnesses, as Isaiah tells us, are filthy rags. How can God accept us? How can God accept you? God will accept you as you plead Messiah's name and righteousness. Jesus is God's anointed king. And here then is a prayer to God the Father that God's people might be received because God the Father will not turn his face away from his anointed one. He looks upon him with favour. Oh, I know we sometimes speak about the Father turning his face away when Jesus was dying upon the cross. But of course that was because during that moment he was bearing the punishment for the sins of all of his people. But as you seek God through Christ, he will receive you. And you will have fellowship with God. And the assurance of peace with God as you plead the name of Messiah, Jesus. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your Messiah. As I move to conclusion this morning, I want you to notice the deep earnestness of David in this psalm. We noted it in verses 3 to 5 particularly. But also the earnestness of all of the worshippers of God in this psalm. David was determined to find a house for God. He was determined to seek out the ark and thereby seek out the presence of God. And the worshippers taking up the theme are urgent in pleading God's favour, pleading for God's favour because of the Messiah. And we too need to have that same earnestness in seeking after God. I asked just now, have is there someone who said, well, I sought God, but I don't feel I found him? And yet you may say to me, you've already quoted that expression of Jesus, seek and you will find. So I have. But remember too, those words uh, spoken through Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. All your heart. All your heart. So much 21st century Christianity is casual and is half-hearted. And I say that not to sound off about every other church. It can be true of us here as well this morning. We can become casual, half-hearted, nominal, 
May God stir up every believer here to seek fellowship with God more closely day by day. And if you've never known the Lord, then seek him earnestly today. David says, surely I will not go up into the chamber of my house or to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord. Yes, that may have been hyperbole, but let that be your attitude as you seek after God to give yourself no rest until you've found him. To earnestly plead in prayer to him that you might know the blessing of his salvation, that he will grant you his free spirit. Go to him today, earnestly, urgently, desiring the favour of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, we pray your forgiveness for the many times when we are half-hearted or even casual about seeking your face, about worshipping you. We know that for the Old Testament believers it was a, a matter of great importance to gather at the appointed times for the set feasts to worship you in the prescribed way. And they did so with a joy clothed in your righteousness. And we pray that New Testament believers then may have that same earnestness, that same recognition of the importance that we gather together to worship you, our great God. Help us to do so wholeheartedly. And Lord, we come to you conscious that we need our Messiah. We need your anointed one. We thank you for him, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, O God, that each one of us here may find favour with you through faith in him. Lord, please hear us in these things for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Our last hymn is number 932, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 932.
bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord give you the light of his countenance and give you peace. Amen.